Hello. Today we're with Ben Cloud, a noted trial lawyer from Las Vegas. Ben attended the University of Utah, both for his undergraduate degree and his law degree. Went right down to the state of Nevada, became admitted in the bar, practiced in an insurance defense firm for about a year and wanted to get out there and represent a plaintiff. So we're honored to have you here, Ben, today and want to share some of your insights in your practice. Thanks for coming. Hey, thanks for having me, Brian. Appreciate it. Ben, I want to jump right into it. My understanding is that you've had success trying uh, low impact, minimal damage. I think they call those MIST, yep. minimal impact soft tissue cases. How is it that you got involved in those kind of cases? Well, Brian, as you know, those are the cases that the insurance companies usually flag as being some sort of a fraudulent case. Uh, they don't really look at the merits of the case. They look at the, the bumper. And so if you look at the trial reporter for cases that go to trial, 90% of those cases are, are uh, low impact cases. And uh, I never shy away from, from trying a case. I kind of joke around and say, I'll try a baloney sandwich. And uh, so I've, I've had a lot of success in, in those cases. I tried to figure them out early on and feel well, like I've tell, had tell us a little bit about the types of uh, these low impact, low property damage cases that you've tried. Uh, well, I've had, uh, I'm coming up on about 10 of them. I've tried eight of them to verdict. And uh, there are cases that range anywhere from almost no property damage. I think the, the one case that I tried actually. Uh, the one case that I lost, um, there was zero property damage. Did you and try to keep that out from evidence, the, the, the pictures of the property damage? You know, I have done that, uh, but my experience has been that usually the defense lawyer, a good defense lawyer, will figure out a way to get that in. So the way that I've uh, figured out to handle those cases is just to just hit it head on and to actually embrace the property damage, and I usually will will – print one of the photographs that's the very worst for me and stand up there first thing in opening statement and, and point to the photo and say, Hey, look, this is why we're here. Um, but you know, other than the, than the one case, I've had a lot of other cases with minimal damage, you know, 1000, 2000 in property damage. Um, and a lot of cases, uh, with, uh, very low estimates as well. So a lot of people have to try these cases. What insights would you give them about trying these cases and some points for them to get a good verdict and try these cases, low impact damage cases? Sure. I think the number one thing that people have to, uh, the trial lawyers for these types of cases have to have is passion. Um, passion for the cases and they have to have a belief in the case. I remember watching a DVD that Rick Friedman put out on trial guides, the DVD called, um, moral court advocacy. And Rick talked about, you know, the Civil War and analogized the Civil War and how, you know, the South had better, more experienced generals. They had, you know, better army, better equipment, but the North prevailed because the North had a worthy cause. And uh, I, in my heart and in my, in my, truly in my core, I believe that the defense in these cases is immoral. I mean, they're essentially calling your client a liar. They're calling your client a cheat. And so I think that you need to have passion about those cases. And I think that uh, once, when you have that, you'll figure out the other areas. So you brought up Rick Friedman, who is a good friend of mine, is a tremendous trial lawyer, tremendous person, but very passionate about what he does. But I'm sure that's not a guy that, you know, you just happen to run in on the street. In preparing yourself to do these trials, are there outside things that you go to? You mentioned this core advocacy videotape that Rick had done. What other things do you look to to help improve your game? Absolutely. I remember in law school, my law school writing professor had a saying. She said, monkey see, monkey do. And she said, if you want to be a successful lawyer, look to other successful lawyers and try and uh, try and do what they're doing. So as a young lawyer, as, a, as what you know Don Keenan would say, a puppy lawyer, um, I sought out Folks like yourself, uh, like Don, like Rick, Paul Levera, Gary C. Johnson, uh, guys throughout the nation that I felt like really were getting great results and tried to mimic and, and figure out uh, what they were doing. Uh, one of the big, I guess, kind of a 
moment in my career though was a realization that you know I, I can't be Brian Panish. There's only one Brian Panish. I can't be Rick Friedman. So I had to uh, use the things that I learned and uh, develop my own style, which I believe that I've done. Uh, but certainly, you know, you can learn from pretty much anybody. And I tried to find the the people out there that were the very best. I'm still waiting for you, Brian, to uh, write a book or two or ten, so that we can learn from you. Put out some some. Well, I don't know how Rick and these guys do it. They're so busy, and they they must have better discipline than me. I like to do other things too, but someday, man. But we're waiting. Let's get back to this. We're waiting, Brian. These attitudes of these cases, these low impact things. You talk about passion. Sure. Well, what other things would you tell us about? Them? people should look out for certainly i think you've got to understand the science behind these types of cases when you drill down on the science and really understand the science the science actually favors the plaintiff Uh, there are a lot of literature uh, uh, studies out there uh, research that uh, proves that individuals can and do get get hurt in these types of cases especially if they have certain risk factors um, a guy that's uh, pretty well known in the plaintiff world, a guy named Art Croft, has done a lot of research. Um, as a young lawyer, I actually spent the time and went to his, um, you know, he has, I think he's retiring, but he had some some courses. I went to those courses. I tried to absorb all of the research that I could. I tried to get on and do my own research. Google Scholar is a great resource for attorneys that want to learn these areas. You can buy a lot of books off of Amazon.com. but in reality, the science really supports uh, plaintiffs in these cases, specifically certain types of plaintiffs. You know, if you're a middle-aged female passenger, I mean, uh, in, in a female in a rear-end accident, you have a much higher likelihood than, than uh, somebody that doesn't have those same uh, characteristics. So you got the case, it's going to trial, you're getting ready to pick the jury. The judge reads a statement of the case. This is a personal injury case brought by Mrs. Smith against the Jones Company. Mrs. Smith alleges that she was rear-ended and suffered uh, significant injuries. Defense disputes that she was injured and the nature and extent of injuries. That's basically what they'd say, right? Yeah. Now, you know that you got the picture that you can't see the damage. You're, you're standing up the ward eye of the jury. How do you start out? So the very one of the very first things that I do is I discuss the biggest weakness that I have in the case, something I learned from from Jerry Spence. Um, you know, address it, embrace it, hit it head on. And with the property damage issue, um, I've learned that an analogy is at a, at a cost effective way that you get such a broad base, broad uh, sense of information uh, that you can get. Four, five hundred, two, three hundred, four. You know, you really just tell them what you need, and you can get information from a large uh, population. And the information is invaluable. It truly is. So, to give us some examples of things you've learned that you've converted into your cases. Sure. So there are a lot of different things that I've used uh, jury analysts for. Um, simple things from messaging how is a certain message going to be perceived or how is um, a case that I recently had was a low impact case that was also a disputed liability case. And uh, we were concerned because my client uh, appeared by all facts had the opportunity to avoid the collision in the case, but there were certain buzzwords that uh, were really important to the jurors when they looked at either why was the defendant not at fault or why was the defendant at fault depending on how you uh, presented the case or presented the question similarly we asked the same types of questions about the plaintiff why was the plaintiff not at fault or why was the plaintiff at fault and there were certain themes and messages that came through certain buzzwords that were vital that were used in both ways to either explain away uh, or explain the fault in the case so that was one reason. One reason was just the messaging. Another reason uh, that we've used, uh, that we found is very helpful, is is the sequencing of evidence. Um, Talk about that sequence and evidence and how you use the focus groups to work on that. Certainly. So I recently had another case uh, that was a bicycle versus a pedestrian, uh, or excuse me, a, a vehicle versus bicycle case. 
and it took place in a busy part of town in Nevada out on uh, Boulder Highway. And there was video footage of the event from one of the neighboring casinos. And if you looked at the one angle, the only angle that we had, by all means, it, it really looked as though uh, my client was at fault, primarily at fault. We didn't believe that based on his testimony. We believed that uh, the driver of the vehicle had ample opportunity to, to stop. Uh, but we felt like the video was was going to be very difficult to get around. You know, there's the old saying, um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Same type of a thing with the video. And so what we wanted to see, and I learned from another case, was that you can influence the reception or the perception of a video by presenting the the evidence and facts uh, orally. And so what we did, we knew this particular judge, the way that she would sequence things and the way that she would allow evidence to come in. She would not allow certain evidence in the opening statement. And knowing that, uh, we wanted to find out if our evidence presentation in the opening could influence the reception of the jurors of that video. And we actually determined uh, that there was a, a huge change in the perception uh, of the video based on them hearing the evidence first or watching the video first. And so what we did is we created the, the, the best message uh, that we felt was uh, the most accurate message. And we also worked in Vordire to kind of um, undercut the, the video. We talked a lot about uh, um, instant replay in football and how sometimes, you know, people can see something, but they don't have the other, the other uh, angle. And then when you see the other camera angle, well, it becomes obvious that, you know, it was wrong. So we talked a lot about that in Vordire as well. Uh, but that was one thing that was very critical using jury analysts was seeing how the perception could be changed simply by sequencing the evidence that gave us the confidence to, to really move forward with the case. How about bias identification? What, what is that and have you used focus groups to, to help you with that? Absolutely. Bias identification, as you know, is uh, probably one of the very most important things that we do as trial lawyers. We need to find uh, uh, jurors that can be fair and impartial. We need to find jurors that are willing to award uh, the uh, to award fair compensation for our clients. And it's always, it's always, um, it's always something that you want to make sure that you find people that are going to tank your case. And people that are going to tank your case are those who have a bias either against your message or against your particular client or potentially individuals who just for some reason, for whatever reason, they can't award large, uh, large figures. And so we've worked with jury analysts. We had a case recently where uh, the judge, a great judge in Vegas, uh, but the way that in, in that particular courtroom that Vore Dyer is conducted, it's a little bit different than other judges. There's no group questioning. It's all individual questioning one by one. You start with the first juror, then you qualify that juror. You ask the questions, then the defense gets to get up and ask the questions. Then if there's another defense lawyer, they get to get up and ask the questions. And so you can't ask group questions and have an open dialogue. So in that particular case, we felt like it was very important to find out if the jurors were telling us what they actually felt or whether they were telling us what the previous juror had said, just to kind of go, sure. with, the, to go with the flow. So we, we identified a group of, of questions along with the social scientists at uh, jury analysts that, that folks that are usually plaintiff friendly would answer a specific way. And we'd have a good kind of idea of what those questions were going to be. Obviously uh, those weren't 100% predictive. If they were, then nobody would need to <laughs> go to any, any trials, but we would drop those cases in or those questions in periodically as kind of a temperature gauge to check with that uh, juror, that particular juror, if we didn't feel like they were, they were being uh, completely upfront with us, number one, or if we felt like maybe they were saying things to get out of, of uh, the jury process, or if they're nonverbals, 
their body communication was suggesting something other than than what they were communicating with what they were actually saying. And how did that help you? Well, it helped us to uh, drill down uh, in this in the instances where we felt like you know a juror was was uh, maybe not being upfront with us. We would ask those difficult questions, and I you know it's. Uh, something that I've learned over time that sometimes, you know, I'll very politely, very respectfully, um, with the juror's permission, will actually just say something along the lines of, you know, uh, sir, I, um, I can see that your body language is maybe suggesting to me that you're, you're not happy with this line of questioning. Is that, am I accurate there? And, and being willing to have that open discussion sometimes you'll get jurors that will shut down but other times you'll get jurors that will say well you know as i've thought about that they'll open up and tell you actually how they're feeling and and, uh you know that's something that we do what would you say in your career looking back since you've begun are the most important decisions you've made that have made you a better lawyer a better trial lawyer Uh, i think you know, as I look back, if I were to give my young self, um, my young self, some advice, I would, I would say, don't, don't beat yourself up so much over the losses. Um, you're going to have some losses. Rick Friedman often has told me, he says, you know, if you're not losing some cases here and there, you're not trying enough of them. Um, I used to really beat myself up over that. And, uh, you know, I think another thing that I would tell my, my young self is uh, work harder to really understand your client's loss and get to know them better. That's something that I focus on and that I, I spend a lot of time doing is getting to know my clients, getting to really love them, getting to understand them. And that was something that I think I, I didn't do as much of that I needed to do as a younger lawyer. What, what is the best experience that someone that wants to be a trial lawyer can get? The, the best experience that someone, um, what do you mean by that, Brian? Okay, so do you think they should be in court, take that position? One gotcha. of the things that make you a better trial lawyer. Gotcha. And it's I, like golfers, the more absolutely. repetitions you get. Yep, I, yep. Um, I, again, monkey see, monkey do. I can't tell you how many times I went down to Las Vegas and watched trial lawyers like Robert Eglett or Dennis Prince or Bob Vanna, um, watched YouTube videos of you, uh, Brian, uh, watched YouTube videos of, of uh, Rick Friedman. Um, just really try and watch as much as you can. And then obviously don't be afraid to try those cases that nobody else will try. There are a lot of attorneys out there that have a lot of cases that nobody wants to try. If you're willing to be that guy and have that experience, you will learn tremendous. Um, you will learn tremendous lessons about the the jury trial process. The other thing that's that's uh, super important, I believe, is doing a lot of focus groups, because a lot of focus groups gives you that uh, confidence to stand up in front of jurors and do that voir dire, which is vital. So I I agree with you. Just doing the focus group, presenting the case is a good experience for a young lawyer. And when you say do a lot of focus groups, what, what's involved in the focus groups that you're doing? How do you, how do you run them? So I've read a lot of books on how to conduct focus groups, talked to a lot of people, and uh, I don't think there's any magic to it. I don't think there's any uh, right way. I think the, the most important thing you've got to do is you've got to figure out a system so that the jurors the prospective jurors, the focus group participants don't know that you represent one of the parties. So whatever your stick is, whatever your spill is, that's the number one thing, I think. They have to really, truly believe that you don't have a dog in the fight. Otherwise, that you're going to get biased information, information that's not going to help the case. And what about as far as the presentation? Are you going to put in all the evidence? Or are you going to leave some out? How do you deal with that? So I do a lot of different types of focus groups. I do entire presentation focus groups, but I also do some focus groups just to identify how certain pieces of evidence will influence uh, the reception uh, or or the the liability determination or the damage determination. So in those cases, 
I'll start out with a kind of a, a broad fact pattern, and then I'll ask them to vote on certain things. Hand out a piece of paper, tell me about this, this, this. And then I'll sprinkle a little more facts in there that might be a defense fact, it might be a plaintiff fact, it might be just the framing of a specific issue. And then I'll ask them to re-vote again. Sometimes I'll ask a focus group to vote 10 times, 15 times uh, throughout a, a two-hour presentation just to see how certain pieces of evidence influence their decision-making process. And what do you do with the responses when you get them back? Do you analyze them? Do you input them? What do you do? I usually like to keep a, an Excel spreadsheet, put those answers in the Excel spreadsheet, keep that saved in the file. And then you can, uh, you can, you know, if you're collaborating with anybody, they have access to that information. It helps you to recognize and remember the themes of the case. It also helps you to recognize and remember the things that, that are important to the jurors. Because as you know, Brian, a lot of times we as, as lawyers, we put our lawyer brain on and we think we know what's important. But what we find out is, is that, you know, Joe Blow, he doesn't think that what the things that we think are important are, are as important as we think. They find out something completely different that they focus on, and, and that's one thing I've always been surprised about during deliberations. Is yeah, I mean, I, what I like to say is if you think you know, you don't. Yeah. And every day, these jurors, you, you just don't know what's going to be important and what isn't. That's why doing focus groups, as many as you can, and getting more and more people's input, you can kind of set a norm, at least how you think, people will react now, it can be completely different, but you have generally a median kind of an idea of where it's going to be. But certainly, you know, I've been surprised to see things go way one way to the right or to the left, which you just couldn't expect it when sure. you're dealing with jurors. Yeah, exactly. And, and you just never know. It's very unpredictable. How about uh, trying cases in Las Vegas? Everyone says, oh, it's jackpot justice, the casinos. What has been your experience with jurors in Las Vegas and their interaction with a lot of money or money being thrown around in sure. town? Sure. Uh, you know, I believe actually Vegas is a little bit, uh, quite a bit more conservative than, than people give it uh, credit for. I think that the inundation of uh, marketing in Las Vegas, uh, that's one thing that always comes up in every single board dire. Is you talking about lawyer advertising. Lawyer advertising. People are always uh, surprised when they move to Vegas or visit the Vegas. They see more lawyer advertisements than anything else. And so I think that Vegas jurors are actually more on guard for the frivolous type of a lawsuit. They want to do more to protect the community from that type of a lawsuit. But I also believe that when you have a just cause, they absolutely are willing to uh, enforce the, the community rules and and protect the other members of society. And, and money, if if the evidence supports it, at least my experience is that they'll give the money if you prove the case. Absolutely. And, and but I, I think everywhere jurors are skeptical when they come into the case. They're not pro plaintiff. They're not pro defendants. Oh, some are, but most of them are kind of skeptical of lawyers and the whole process, and they don't understand it. And their experience with lawyers, if they have met them, is seeing them on TV. Sure. Saying, you know, bring your case to me. So how is it to you address the jurors and say, look, you know, this is not a TV commercial. This is a real case. How do you, how do you deal with that? Well, that's actually one of the things that I felt like is, has been very, very important to do in these low impact cases because folks that see that type of a case, they automatically assume it's frivolous. And so I have a dialogue or a discussion topic that I that I do in, in nearly every single voir dire on frivolous cases. But then I also ask the jurors to get them start thinking uh, about frivolous defenses. And if there's another side of the coin and get them thinking about, you know, and ask the same types of questions. Well, do you think that defense lawyers come into court and say things and have their clients say things, have the, the experts they hire say things to save money? You know, if plaintiffs are coming into, into courtrooms trying to get money, trying to get rich, trying to win the lottery, uh, is there another side of that coin? And, and at least get the folks thinking about that, about that process. Okay. Been great here, Ben, to have you. Appreciate it. I know you're just on the rise in your career and expect to see many more big verdicts coming out of there.
Thank Thanks, you so Brian. much for being there. I appreciate having me. Thank you. All right.